Hello, everybody. Um, thanks uh, for uh, Tivanya, um, that I can borrow some time from his talk. <laughs> and thanks to the Alps Committee for um, inviting me here. Um, I think it's a really nice Congress and uh, quite interesting, definitely. So thank you all for being here um, on a topic that is not that well uh, common to talk about. It's about animal experiments, but this will be well, a minor part of the presentation um, because I'm going to talk a lot about um, human-based novel technologies um, and I hope it yeah, bears something new for all of you and uh, we do it in regard um, to psychedelic research. So I was already introduced twice, so I think I'm Julia, I'm um, scientific officer for Doctors Against Animal Experiments and um, I'm part of the scientific team and we produce articles and information for the public um, and for politicians as well. And yeah, let's start with some examples. Of course, there are many examples. Um, I will stick to just um, two main ones. Um, so animal experiments are conducted uh, for different reasons. Um, first of all, the therapeutic effects. So you look at an animal to assess what the effect of a substance is. And for example, in this kind of research, the full swim test is used. Um, it is, yeah, briefly to say it's, um, the mice or rats are used and they are put in a, in a bucket of water and they have to swim in order not to drown. And um, after some time, they give up and start to float. So, um, and when, yeah, a substance that um, has the set has an effect on this animal um, is administered to this animal, and afterwards this animal swims a bit longer in the bucket before it starts to flow, then this substance is considered to be, yeah, antidepressant or does it it does have an effect on the animal. Of course, this is a test with yeah, high anxiety for the animals, um, as well as the other one. It's about learned helplessness um, by using electroshocks. So after several time, the animals yeah, start to show behavioral signs of yeah, depression. Yeah, it's like a de uh, depression-like behavior, and yeah, there are other experiments, um, for example, for pharma uh, pharmacokinetics. So it's not about a substance that has a special medical effect, more or less. So it's just to, to assess this substance, um, as well for regulatory testing, especially toxicology. Um, but of course, there are many more experiments conducted. Um, in psychedelic research, mice and rats are mainly used, but uh, pigs and monkeys are as well used in some experiments. Mm. And during the past time, um, animal experiments have been yeah, scientifically questioned even by the researchers, uh, especially the first swim test that is to date at some institutions, um, they, they banished this experiment, but it's not prohibited, but um, it doesn't really, yeah, what the animal shows is not translatable to humans in most cases. Um, and an example are the drug failures. Of course, we uh, here have different examples, but uh, this is a very good example, I think. So the preclinical phase is conducted in two different animal species um, for effectiveness and safety. And when a, a drug, a substance, or for example, a psychedelic proves itself in this part of the phases, then it can enter the clinical phases in humans. And again, if the drug is effective and safe, it is launched onto the market. So and to assess are uh, the animals or the animal experiments, do they, yeah, yeah are, they, are the, the reactions similar to these in humans? Then you can look at what is the input and what is the output. So how many, um, how many drugs that been, have been effective in animal experiments are brought onto the market. And I think most of you are aware of the, um, of the quotes. So 
um, it's around 10% of all drugs are launched onto the market. So 90% failure uh, rate, and um, especially when it comes to, yeah, here what is interesting, um, here these indications are even lower in success. Um, and that is mainly due to biological reasons. So, of course, if a drug fails in this process, um, it can be due to many different reasons, but the main reasons are it does not work in humans and it doesn't, or it causes side effects, um, even though that the, yeah, the animal experiments didn't show that before. So this is um, a good example that the uh, results from animal experiments are not really translatable to the human situation. Of course, the next question is, okay, what, what, yeah, what can we do? Do we have uh, maybe different approaches or do we have different systems that are better, for example? Um, and I would like to concentrate today on organoids. Um, this is a technology that is, yeah, it's already in the labs, of course, and um, the farmer is using it, but it's not that very well known. So, um, but it's a great idea. So you can grow mini organs in the lab. So you, when you have a biopsy, for example, um, then you can cultivate those cells and they differentiate into different kind of cells and they form, yeah, they form those mini <laughs> organs, so to say. And as you can see on the pictures, they developed typical structures, um, yeah, organ typical cells and they resemble the human organs of course, more or less, but uh, at least it's the right species. And if you don't have a biopsy, you can um, use a special technique um, that was worth a Nobel Prize uh, some years before, and um, that was the in induced pluripotent stem cell. So you can just, when you have a hair root cell, you can reprogram that cell in the lab and you can differentiate it into different, yeah, different cells of the body. For example, to liver cells, to brain cells, to heart cells, to lung cells, and they grow yeah, those organoids, and then you can test substances on it. Um, they, can, they stand for themselves, but they can be integrated on microfluidic systems or those chips, um, this is uh, how they're called. Um, and for example, um, when it comes to tax studies, this is a very important topic, um, we, um, have, for example, a liver chip where a substance can be assessed. Um, and to look at the predictability of the system, um, the researchers took 27 drugs. Some of them were, uh, both were, um, all of them were known um, to, that are not not toxic or hepatotoxic. And yeah, it was, um, yeah, and it was with, uh, they, they tried to find out how high the pre uh, predictability of the liver ship are. And it shows that nearly 90% of the hepatotoxic drugs were correctly identified by this chip, which is really, really high. Um, the chips detected all non-toxic uh, drugs. Um, and yeah, nearly 90% of the hepatotoxic drugs, well, animal experiments did not discover a single substance um, when it comes to uh, hepatotoxicity. So this is a great example um, how to get results um, that mimic more the human situation. Yeah, especially here. Um, in this context, I think brain organoids are most uh, of, of, of great interest uh, for you all. This is why I put the slide um, and just to emphasize that they can be a really cool tool to assess different kinds of, for example, receptor binding or changing in um, synaptic structure, um, gene expression, metabolics, all this stuff. Yeah? And to have a, um, an example for the blood-brain barrier on a chip, um, here you can see, well, here you can see that it's some kind of sandwich approach. So you have um, a blood-brain barrier chip 
then you have a brain chip and another blood brain, brain barrier chip. So you can mimic the, um, yeah, the way so a substance enters the brain and it leaves the brain again um, in, a, yeah, in a very good way. Um, and you can see on the top there are, whoops, wrong, this one, yeah. <laughs> Uh, here we have endothelial cells, and this is like the blood vessel and uh, yeah, blood -like, um, a blood-like solution is flowed through it. Um, and then yeah, you, can, you can assess uh, which substances will cross the blood-brain barrier. And of course, you can do something like, um, yeah, getting uh, different, different substances into it. For example, in this uh, paper, they used meth um, to yeah, have a look what the chip is doing with it. Um, and it could be shown that uh, it opens up the human blood-brain barrier, as is observed in vitro and in human already. Um, and you can see a difference in protein expression. As I said before, we have on one side the blood-brain barrier chip, then the brain, and then um, again, the blood-brain barrier, and those outer chips, they show a difference in yeah, gene regulation, protein expression, and all the stuff. So this is a nice in vitro approach uh, to assess the transport, the function, um, and of course the toxicity of neuroactive drugs. Of course, you can apply this to, to any substance you would like, even to chemicals, but here in this context, um, with great for, um, yeah, for uh, psychedelica. Yeah. Um, of course, there are many, many more um, human-based methods. For example, bioprinting is uh, very important or has increased during the past years and uh, in silico, so all AI, all the stuff. Um, and yeah, there were so many nice methods, and we, we knew them, we always discovered new methods, and, and we said we don't, have a, we, yeah, we don't have a database to look it up. Um, we don't have a database that, for example, regula uh, regulatory authorities can have a look at and assess if there is an alternative method which can be used instead of animal testing. And this is why we created our own. Um, it's called the NAT database, uh, non animal technologies, mm, and at the moment we have more than uh, 1,800 results, but it, um, so it's filled continuously. So when you um, look into it in half a year, we have, I think, 300 more. And as you can see, um, of course, you can just type in a keyword um, of interest, but you can uh, look for a different yeah, for a field of research, then uh, you can tick boxes, or you can um, yeah, uh, search by model. Sorry, I shouldn't turn. <laughs> um, for example, here what I was uh, talking about, the organoids, and um, yeah, in silico omics, we have uh, yeah, bioprinting um, and validated methods. So it's always worth a look. It's not specifically for psychedelics, but there are, yeah, lots of methods that can principally be, um, be applied to, to, to any substance and psychedelics as well. So um, if somebody is interested in using those human-based methods, it's definitely worth a look to um, yeah, get an impression what is possible today. So we are at the end uh, of my uh, talk. So we have on the one hand, a yeah, poor predictability of animal models, and on the other hand, um, quite good predictability of those human-based methods, and um, this calls for a paradigm shift. So from animal experiments to the human-based uh, technologies um, yeah, for enhanced safety for patients and uh, people. And for animals. <laughs> okay, so that's the end. Thank you very much. Yeah, we also...
We also have some time for questions if anybody wants to. <laughs> Why is this not working? Hello. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, despite all of these technologies that we have now, uh, are there still some benefits to animal testing that uh, w we still use them for a reason? Or is it just cruelty? Excuse me, uh, can you please repeat the question? It was uh, hard for me to, to understand. Do you want me to... to uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't understand the question. Could you please repeat it? I would like to know, despite all of these technologies that we have now, uh, are there still reasons to use animals in testing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there are very few um, experiments that are really prohibited because even though when there is um, alternative method that can replace an animal test, it takes a very long time until it is validated and it's regulatory accepted. So um, even when there is a validated method, it takes yeah, a really long time until a special animal test is prohibited by law. So basically, there are so many tests that are still yeah, conducted. So yes, it's definitely. It's, in general, it's a problem with the validation. So it, it's a process that lasts so long. For example, those organoids, they are not yet validated because they don't exist long enough. So it takes um, an average 15 years to validate an alternative method. And it's quite a long time. So. Um, yeah, I hope it will be quicker <laughs> uh, in the future because the, the predictability of those human-based methods is so much better. Um, I hope this will accelerate uh, the process, but um, yeah, there are very lots of animal um, experiments, even the severe ones still conducted. Thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, I'm here. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but of what I know, microglia cannot be induced uh, using uh, induced uh, pluripotent cells. So my question is, how far can you investigate uh, the permeability of the blood-brain barrier without having any microglia in your organoid? Um, well, we, we don't investigate directly, so we just gather the information. So this is why I um, sort of was... Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so it always depends on, on, on the special research field, of course. So um, it's not that yeah, we're that deep into this topic. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, and this is always a bit difficult, so we can... What, is our aim is that we can show what is possible today, um, but at least the researcher has to decide what is, yeah, um, adequate for for its for its research field. Of course, we can just provide say, okay, there is there are so many possibilities, and you can you can pick your your own, and uh, yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so thanks a lot for the speech. I have a question about the limitations of this methods in general. So I personally believe that at least 80-90% of animal trials will be eliminated with these like very precious methods. But for example, for emo, um, behavioral studies, where we cannot have models in vitro, for example, more invasive behavioral studies, such as um, substance abuse and uh, effects on the behavioral perspective, for example, conducted on mice, which have been fed with an uh, um, addictive substance such as cocaine, and their um, behavior has been tracked. So how can we implement this in vitro, or should we mm -hmm. just switch to human models instead of it? Like, what's the approach of this um, society, mm -hmm. or your own approach for this yeah. kind of? Um, yeah, well. Um of course, it's, um, you always need different approaches. So there is, it is not the idea to, to, to take an animal test and to replace it one-to-one -one with, with another test. So it's always an 
integrated approach, more to say. So you need different kinds of methods. You don't need only the organ, you don't need only the cell culture, uh, or the bioprinting, or the um, AI, or whatever. So when you combine it with, especially when it comes to psychedelics, they um, you already have clinical trials, so you can um, investigate the effects in humans itself, like we saw it before. So it is, yeah, wildly applied to people. So it is definitely an approach that you can, yeah, have a look. What what can you um, assess in humans, for example, behavioral um, effects, something like that. I don't say that's easy, but <laughs> I think it's, um, yeah, you, you can do that definitely with different kinds of methods um, in which you can investigate the effects in humans and you can additionally use these methods to um, look at different kinds of or the underlying um, neuronal um, pathways, for example. So it's not, there is not one for all. <laughs> okay, one, one last question. Hi, hello, over here. Ah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, so I have a question in novel drug development. So for example, there's a lot of companies that are trying to develop non-psychedelic drugs that are based on the psychedelic structure. And back in the, the good old days of pharmacology, the people developing these would just try them themselves, right? And then they'd be able to say, hey, this is psychedelic, this is not psychedelic. And then I think with, with you know, the famous case with MPTP, where people just gave themselves Parkinson's from trying some new drug, people are now really scared of chemicals, generally. Like, if we don't know anything about the clinical effects, then we assume that there might be some horrific neurotoxic effects that could cause long-term damage. And so now we have to go through all these animal studies and preclinical tests. Do you think that that's overblown? This is a sort of chemophobia that we're in now in the 2020s? Or do we think that this is rational and that we should be doing a lot of extensive neurotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, cardiotoxicity testing before going into humans? Mm. Um. I think it won't take long until we don't need animal experiments in general, especially for tox studies, because uh, it's, already, it's already shown that uh, they mostly have a higher predictability, and you can assess that um, it's going to improve over the years even. So um, I think the main problem is that they are not... I think people have trust issues when it comes to uh, non-animal methods. I think that's the most... Uh, the the thing that hinders most progress, more or less, even um, when I'm talking to scientists, um, most of them, or, or some of them, never heard of organoids, for example. So and when you have never heard of a certain method, you don't trust it at the beginning. So you have to dig deep into the topic and see, okay, what what does it yield? What um, how, how effective is it? Can we can we really rely on it? And I think that will take much more time. I think um, scientifically, that will be much quicker than we can replace a lot of methods. But um, the processes with the people and with the authorities and with the law, that's, I, yeah, of course I hope it will be quicker, but um, I'm afraid it will take some time. But this is because I'm here to show the methods and say, okay, we have um, valuable tools for research and, um, yeah, hoping it makes a difference. But right now, you wouldn't try out novel psychedelics going straight into phase one. You would still say that we should do all the talk screening using animals. Um, I wouldn't, but it's, it's the law. That's the problem. <laughs> so pharma companies, for example, uh, when they... Yeah, they normally don't really work on psychedelics, <laughs> that's, uh, sadly. Um, but they are, are already using these methods to enhance their chance of approval. So they still are, yeah, they still require to do animal testing by law to get the market to get the drug on the market. Um, but they're using these organ chips. So I just shot. Uh, I had this liver chip. But today, it's even possible to get 10 organs on one chip. So it's an, um, a multi-organ chip. And you can 
combine different organs and uh, have some kind of organism, more or less. And it's very interesting when it comes to personalized med medicine, um, when, you can, when you have a patient and you get a patient samples and you can, you can build your patient on a chip. Yeah, so by law, different, but scientifically they are far ahead. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah.